Um, tonight, she's going to be focusing and we're going to be talking a little bit about the history of artificial light and how it relates to sustainability of today's emerging lighting technologies. So here we go with the LED paradox. Um, please join me in welcoming Andrea Hicks. Thank you for that warm welcome. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Nods? Okay. So first, I'd like to thank the organizers of Wednesday Night at the Lab for allowing me this platform to present some work, and to thank all of you for being here to learn about the LED paradox. So a little bit about what we'll go over tonight. We'll look in what is artificial light. What's the history of lighting in Chicago? It's a major city, not so far from here. It's a nice place to start. Our consumption of light, what technology changes mean, Jevons' paradox, and novel consumption. So what is artificial light? This is the point where everyone's like, artificial light, it's in this room, we have it, I'll point to it. So to take it a more philosophical way, it renders the invisible visible. It's safety, it's traffic control signals. I'm from civil engineering, so I have to throw in some examples like that. It's street lights at night that encourage people to walk. It's productivity. Without artificial light, there would be no night shift at hospitals. There would be no third shift at plants. And it decouples us from the patterns of the sun. We're no longer dependent on the sun as our sole source of light. And here's a quote from Harold Platt, who wrote The Electric City in 1991. And that centers on Chicago and its history of light. And we'll talk a little bit about his book to give some background context. But the bright lights of the city pr quickly became both a status symbol and a physical manifestation of progress, wealth, and amenities. So light isn't just light. It's a symbol of progress. If you think about a cartoon, what happens when someone has an idea? They get the light bulb. So it's more than just illumination. So this is a timeline of lighting in Chicago. In 1878, Barrett demonstrated Rush's arc lamp. And within a decade, there were almost 7,000 arc lamps built and operated in the city of Chicago at an annual cost of a million dollars, which is a lot. And so the electric suppliers, this is also from Platform, <coughs> faced a consumer market with no bounds. And this is a question that will permeate our talk tonight. What is saturation of light? When do we have enough light? How much light is too much light? And, but there were some problems with this arc lamp. It was a fire hazard. It was big. You couldn't use it in a residential setting. So in 1880, or 1879, depending, Thomas Edison invented the first marketable incandescent bulb. And Chicagoans suddenly had this choice. What kind of light do I want? Do I want electric light? Do I want a kerosene lamp? Do I want to go by the old gas lighting standby? And so these incandescent bulbs were much safer than arc lamps and could be easily scaled to residential use. But really, electric lighting was only for the wealthy at first. It wasn't for the everyday person. But at the same point, there was this radical shift in psychological perception of interior lighting levels. And this goes back to our question of how much light is enough light, how much light is too much light. So what had seemed all right before was dark, gloomy, and depressing. So already we're craving more light because we have more light. Now in 1893, Chicago's World Fair, Chicago was dubbed the City of Light. And by 1912, about half of Chicago's middle class families had electricity in their homes and electric light. So look at that quote again. It's a status symbol, it's progress, it's wealth, it's amenities. Light is more than just illumination. It means we're moving forward. And some photos from the World's Fair. They're not great, but you know, early 1900s. And it was amazing, we had all of this light. So before we start to talk about the actual consumption of light, some little background. One unit I'll talk a lot about today is a lumen. And a lumen is an international standards unit, unit for the measurement of brightness. 
And another way to think about it, it's the light of one candle, one foot away. Although I suspect most people don't compare their light bulbs to candles at feet. Maybe people do, and that's okay. And so it's a measure of light output, and it's a nice way when we talk about different efficiencies of lighting to compare them. About 800 lumens is about a 60 watt incandescent, which translates into CFLs and LEDs. So this, we're already using our lumen. This is terawatt hours per year of light consumed in the United Kingdom. It's a study by Tao et al. in 2010. That looks at the consumption of light over time and changes in technology. So here we are transitioning from candles to gas to kerosene and eventually to electricity. And the whole time we're consuming more light. Yes, the lines go up, consuming more light. And it's largely, this work by Tao et al. was largely based on some earlier work by Fouquet and Pearson that looked at the price of lighting. So how much per million lumen hours, so we're using those lumens again. So what's the cost of light as we transition over time from gas light to kerosene light to electric light? And the point is it's been going down over time in the UK during the study, which ends at about 2000. I see people talking, this is a good sign. So, um, so okay, so we've been using more light and the cost of light has been going down, at least in the UK. So the Energy Information Administration re very recently put together a chart of energy consumption in the United States starting from 1776, which is nice. <laughs> Usually you can't find data, at least in engineering when I'm looking for something from the 1700s. And okay, so we consume more energy. This is in quadrillion British thermal units. And our energy consumption broken down by what we're consuming. And over time we've transitioned from coal to more toward natural gas and petroleum products. So okay, the question is how much energy do we use for artificial light? Is it a lot? Is it a little? Would we even see it on this graph? So when I started studying this, and the first data is from maybe around 2001, we were using 8.2 quadrillion British thermal units of electricity for lighting in the United States. So if you take a look, that is a little bit higher than nuclear energy consumption in 2015. So based on the promise of this talk, do you think it's gone up or down? Some up? Shall we raise hands? Who thinks it's gone up? Okay. Who thinks it's gone down? Are you mentioning input or output? Uh, total energy consumption. And the energy input is Right. And who doesn't know? <laughs> That's okay. So it's actually gone down which seems a little counterintuitive with the talk called the LED paradox and the rebound effect. But in 2010, about 7.5 quadrillion British thermal units were devoted to electricity for lighting. And in 2013, 6.9 quads, which comprised about 18% of total US electricity usage. So it's gone down. Why are we talking about energy rebound in the paradox. We'll get there. So let's think a little bit about efficiency. And here we've got a complex, com, compact fluorescent lamp, which was invented or inspired in 1973 during the oil crisis, and in 1974 manufact, made by an engineer at General Electric. And the 1980s CFLs were introduced to the public. So who remembers that? Okay. Maybe half a dozen people. That's a good start. And, but there were some problems. They were expensive. They were about $25 to $35 per light bulb. 
And that number is a little fuzzy because they're often subsidized by the electrical utilities. They're blue. They failed early and they had inconsistent light input, output, not well received. So as we talk about lighting technologies, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about how they work. So an incandescent, which is sort of what we think of as the conventional technology, an electric current runs through the filament, heating it, and then it starts to glow and light is produced. But what about a CFL? So in a CFL, it has this curly Q shape, right? And an electric current goes through the argon and a small amount of mercury vapor, which is stored in the curly Q. That generates invisible ultraviolet light that excites a fluorescent coating, which is on the outside and produces light. And this is from our, the friendly folks at Energy Star. So what about LEDs? So LEDs, or light emitting diodes, and we'll talk about how they work in a second, are considered an enabling technology because they enable other products and other technologies that would not be possible without them. And this is a graph from data mined from the US patent database on the percentage of light emitting diode patents per year, applications per year, broken down by their applica the application's application. So what is the goal of this? And you can see LEDs for illumination are near the top. And illumination is what we primarily thought of, of what we do with light. You light a candle to have light. You turn on an incandescent light bulb to have light. But with LEDs, we start to have other options. We have liquid crystal displays. We have manufacturing, communication, military, medicine. There's all and novelties, which we'll talk about later. There's some exciting novelties. And so they have all of these properties. They don't get really hot. They're small. You could enclose them and they could get wet. And the first red LED came about in 1961. So they've been around, but we're now just starting to use them for residential lighting applications. So how do LEDs work? And I enjoyed this. This is from um, howstuffworks.com. And forgive me if you've spent time studying quantum mechanics. This is just a very brief overview. So LEDs are semiconductors. And current flows to the diode and the electrons move. There's holes that exist at a lower energy and there's free electrons. And when the electron moves to a lower energy level, it emits a photon, which is light. Very brief overview. And that is embedded. This is a red LED, but it doesn't have to be a red LED. You have your semiconducting material embedded in the lamp. Okay, so we have LEDs. They work a little bit differently. Does anyone have an LED at home? Okay, there's a few folks. How about an LED with you right now? Okay, so there's people with LEDs. Are there people with smartphones right now? Okay, so these exist, we have them. There are many in this room at this moment. So when we start to look at the, at the lighting market, and this is from the US Department of Energy in 2012 based on their 2010 data. This is annual electricity consumption in terawatt hours per year, broken down by sector. And the focus today will be residential. And residential, okay, so it's primarily in 2010 incandescence. Do you think that's changed? Maybe? Okay. <laughs> so it has at some people's houses for sure. And other people's houses we'll talk about too. But overall, in 2010, 
we used about 700 terawatt hours of electricity annually for lighting. And although residential isn't the biggest sector, it's interesting because you're starting to deal with consumers and their individual behaviors. Do you think people demand more light over time? Maybe? So in 2001, the average number of sockets per household was 43. Do you think that's gone up? Yes. Yeah. So as of 2010, the average is 51. And that's one way of consuming more light, that you have more light bulbs in your house. Now, there's been some evolutions in technology too. And this starts at 2011 and goes through 2016. And we've got pictures of an incandescent and a CFL and an LED. And these are residential screw and type replacements with a lumen output of about 800, so 60 watt bulb equivalents. So we're comparing apples to apples, mostly. So in 2011, an LED was $33.90, which seems like a lot for a light bulb. And if we go to 2013, okay, we're at about $13, and today we're at about $4.50. And incandescents have dropped a little bit. There's some other factors at play that we'll talk about. And CFLs have dropped a little bit too. The energy consumption has gone down, has steady for the conventional incandescent, and it's gone down a bit for an LED, going from 12 watts to about eight. There's also a huge difference in the lifetimes of these bulbs. So the lifetime of an incandescent is about 1,000 to 2,000 hours. And the CFL, uh, about 8,000 to 12,000. But an LED is about 25,000. So in theory, you could have a light bulb that lasts a really long time, even if it costs a little more. And it should be more efficient to run because it consumes less energy. So then everyone should buy them, right? No, maybe? So we talked a little bit about the cost. And this is a chart looking at ownership cost. So the ownership cost is the purchase price plus the use price over the normalized over the lifetime. And in this case, this is all in $2010. And it looks at the ownership cost of light from 1800 to about 2011 where we're transitioning from fire, which are things like candles, kerosene lamps, to incandescence, fluorescence, high, intensi high intensity discharge, LEDs, and CFLs. So the ownership cost has been going down, much like we saw in that one chart looking at the United Kingdom, where they were transitioning from gas and kerosene to electricity. And there's some other factors at play also. So the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. Who has heard of it? Four people, all right, we're doing well. <laughs> Who has heard somewhere on television or the internet about someone trying to ban incandescent bulbs? All right, we're talking about the same thing. So the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 took effect between 2012 and 2014. And it's not a ban per se on bulbs, but it requires increasing of the efficiency of incandescence. So if you look, we've got this EcoSmart box and it says it's a better incandescent. So it's formerly a 60 watt incandescent and what they mean is it produces about 800 lumens. But now, it requires 43 watts. So we've made an efficiency gain. You also start to see things like the lighting facts per bulb, which, does this remind anybody else of food labels? <laughs> That's what I look at, I'm like, calories or brightness? So I can tell by looking at this, the brightness is about 800 lumens, so it's a 60 watt equivalent bulb. And the energy used is about 13 watts, so it's probably a CFL. Or it could be a really early LED. And they rate the lifetime, and they say, okay, we'll use this for three hours a day, 
and it will last for nine years. So it's a way of distilling information. But here's the question. When you heard about the ban on bulbs, did anyone start hoarding incandescents? <laughs> it's OK. Two honest people. All right. So this is David Brooks of Just Bulbs in Manhattan. And I got this from the New York Times, where he's commenting that he has one customer who's ordering thousands and thousands of incandescents because she never wants to be out without them. And to please not tell her husband. <laughs> so he'll be surprised one day when he finds their storage unit of incandescent bulbs. But so we have interesting behaviors that come about too that I do not want a more energy efficient bulb. I'm going to use this incandescent forever. OK. That's part of evolutions of technology. So whenever I talk about CFLs, the question of mercury comes up. Who here knows that a CFL is mercury? All right. How much mercury do you think? So I see some people saying a little bit. <laughs> so it's about, currently they have about five milligrams of mercury per bulb. And OK, is that a lot? Is that a little? Should we care? So there was one study that came out several years ago where they said, OK, so there's five milligrams of mercury in the CFL, but it's more efficient than an incandescent. So what if I look at the life cycle and I burn coal to make my incandescent, power my incandescent throughout the lifetime? Is that, how does the mercury balance work out? And if you move the CFL, even though it has mercury in it, you're saving mercury through the gains in efficiency. So you're coming out ahead. Now, it, I've given talks similar to this enough times that there are some good anecdotes <laughs> that come up. <laughs> Who here has heard of mercurochrome? <laughs> All right. So I was giving this talk once. And I always, almost always, got attacked by someone for the mercury content in CFLs, and they're terrible, and they're going to kill us all in Mini Mata Bay. Um, I was like, OK. So that's what I was expecting. And he comes up, and he starts telling me that he doesn't think the mercury is a big deal. OK, good. Someone's finally not attacking me over this. And so then he tells me about something called mercurochrome, which, help me if I'm wrong, is something at one point used to dab on cuts, sort of clean them and heal them. I was like, oh, OK. So then he proceeds to tell me that he's similar to our friend in New York hoarding the light bulbs, that he's hoarded mercurochrome. <laughs> and he has boxes and boxes full of this, that he still uses it today. Mercury is not a big deal. And then he pulls out a bottle. It's like, OK. I, I guess mercury isn't a big deal to everyone. And that's a really great anecdote to keep next time I talk about this. So just a side note. So one way to think about this, and I alluded to this a little bit when I was talking about the mercury in a CFL versus if you burned coal for the lifetime of incandescent. So something called life cycle assessment. Has anyone heard of it? OK, three or four people in the back. It's a good start. So life cycle assessment is a systematic tool for looking at the environmental impact of a product or process throughout its lifetime. So you're breaking it down into components like raw materials. What's the environmental impact of my raw materials? What is the environmental impact of my manufacturing? What about the use phase? So in this case, when I take the light bulb home, I put it in the socket, I turn it on. And what about end of life? What happens when it's done? So there's some Coca-Cola bottles on this slide. And that's because the first documented life cycle assessment was actually done by the Coca-Cola company, I believe in the 1960s. And they were curious about the energy consumption for their packaging, because energy means money. And they wanted to know, what kind of packaging should I use? What should I put my soda in? Or I could say pop, because I'm from Michigan. Um, and so the study results were never released, but that's sort of what we herald as the first life cycle assessment. So, so 
To put that in perspective, we can look at one, this is from the US Department of Energy, for an incandescent light bulb. And I've got the electricity generation mix on the side, because that's a valid point in this. And okay, so you have your materials and manufacturing, that's a very small part of the life cycle environmental impact. And the really big part is the use phase. So when you take your light bulb home and you use it. And on the bottom we've got all these categories. So you see things like global warming. And global warming, has anyone heard of an environmental footprint? Right, so these are different units to do. So global warming, you're thinking about carbon dioxide emissions. Eutrophication, you're worried about nitrogen. And we like to look at a suite because you might find that while something is very good in one category, it is very bad in another. And you need to think about the environmental trade-offs. <coughs> so it's long been established that the environmental impact for incandescent lighting is during the use phase. So the question was, what about these new, more energy efficient lights? They're more energy efficient, so they should have less use phase impact, but they require more raw materials. So how does this balance out? So we can look at a compact fluorescent, and the use phase is still dominant. Although some phases like non-carcinogenics, we start to see more of the materials in manufacturing. And the same is true when we start to think about light emitting diodes. And in categories like non-carcinogenics, the bigger manufacturing and materials cost has to do with the heat sinks that go into making light emitting diodes. But we're gonna go back. So we know the use phase is dominant and we know the ownership cost has been going down. So it costs less to use these. So who's ever heard of William Stanley Jevons? All right, I got like three or four people again. So he is an economist from the 1800s and he was looking at coal. And he said, when the efficiency of coal usage increases, we're actually using more coal, which was this big revolutionary idea at the time. And some people would say it's revolutionary today. If it's more efficient, how are we consuming more? So who thinks we do? Discounting the title of this talk <laughs> of energy efficiency and the rebound effect. And so there was a study out of MIT that looked at multiple industries over multiple time periods and geographic scales. And they said, okay, we can look at the annual average change in efficiency. So that's your delta E over E. And we can look at the change in consumption. And if the change in consumption is more than the change in efficiency, we're going to outconsume our benefits of efficiency. So if you look at the last column with delta Q over Q and delta E over E, all the numbers are bigger than one which means that over the time scales they looked at, we outconsumed all the benefits of efficiency from, an energy, from a consumption standpoint. And they qualified this though. They said in the short term, you might see savings because increased consumption hasn't caught up when you're it, with your increases in efficiency. But on the long term, we haven't seen this in any of these industries. And they took a large spread of things like passenger air travel, motor vehicles, refrigeration. So one question would be, how do you consume more light? Do we buy more lights? So suddenly the cost of lighting has gone down, I'll buy more. I buy brighter lights. This goes back to when we were talking about electric lighting in Chicago, where they were saying what had once seemed adequate for indoor lighting suddenly seemed dim and dark and hopeless and depressing. So let's have more light because we can have more light and we think we need more light. You could leave the lights on longer. <coughs> Maybe you never turn off your lights then because they're efficient. It's an extreme example, but it's possible. And the more times I've given a talk like this, someone will say, no, I would never, ever, ever leave my lights on longer, never. And then they'll start telling me that, you know, I bought this LED. I'm like, great, you bought an LED. And I decided to put it on my garage. And now I leave it on all night because it's so cheap to run. 
Okay. Well, that goes back to our safety, to what is light. And there's some utility of light that you can't really measure for lumens per watt. It's what is safety, what is security. So, there, this is uh, results from a study that looked at how long do people leave their lights on? And this is a national survey that looked at five or six major metropolitan areas. So there's a spread. The average is 8.9 hours per day, plus or minus 5.1. Okay. <laughs> and the most commonly occurring value was six. However, if you look, there are people who leave their lights on one hour per day and people who leave their lights on 24 hours per day. So looking at this, I would say the population is heterogeneous. <laughs> and I get odd. So they're different. And we can look at questions. This is a slightly older study. So what's the highest price you would pay for an LED? And at the time of the study, an LED was $33.99. And most people said they would pay about $17. Does anyone remember what we're at now? Right, about 450. So in theory, based on this, we should be seeing people buying a lot more LEDs. But populations are heterogeneous. People interpret things differently. And this was a really interesting question from the survey, where we asked, we framed the same question three different ways, essentially. And we called it light bulb A, light bulb B, and light bulb C. So A is an incandescent, B is a CFL, and C is an LED. So we framed it asking people, so it costs so many dollars and it lasts for so many hours, what would you pick? And then we asked the same question. It costs so much, and it would cost you this much to run per year. Which would you pick? And then we also said, OK, it costs this much to purchase, and for the same amount of money, you could drive so many miles per year. Which would you pick? So in, across all three, about half the respondents said they would pick option B, the CFL. And they didn't know it was the CFL, I'm sure. If they had Googled it, they would have known it was the CFL. But you see this movement between question 18 and then when you look at question 19 and 20 of LED versus incandescent. So there's some interesting issues of perception of what is efficient, what should I buy, how should we word things? So, how should we model this? Has anyone heard of an agent-based model? Maybe a social scientist out there? So, agent-based modeling is, has roots in the social sciences, and it's a method commonly used to model individuals. And it's really good at that, and it's been used to model things like fish, geese flying in a V, sheep, and people. But there's more. Those are just a few examples. And the idea is you have all of these individuals following some set of rules, seeking to maximize some utility. And what do they do? So there's this question of, could we apply this to lighting? What do people do if they can pick energy efficient lighting? So the result is this nice chart for an agent-based model, where you've got some population that we informed with our survey data. And if their bulb is burned out, they go and buy a new light bulb. OK, that's a good assumption. It burns out, I'll buy a new one. They use some probabilistic utility to decide which light bulb based on the fact they're a heterogeneous population. So different people value things differently. And then if their bulb is more efficient, they have this question of do they consume more light? And that's informed with the survey data that some people will consume more light. And the question of how much is sort of this interesting tipping point we looked at. So OK, we've got some sort of model. What do we know about the data we put in the model? So one question on the survey that went to this model was your environmental mindfulness or your environmental attitude. How environmentally friendly do you think you are? Do you care? And this is looking at statistically significant correlations for people who thought they were extremely mindful. 
And okay, so they want to save energy. They're concerned about environmental friendliness of what they buy. They apparently were not that interested in the quality of light or how long their light bulbs lasted, which I thought was interesting because you would worry about, well, I'm throwing it out. I'm in the survey, more than 50% of the people threw them out and did not recycle. So and we have our average mindfulness. They're actually worried about the lifetime of the bulb. So it's just interesting to think about the heterogeneity of the population. And OK, so one way you can think about making these agents in a model is they were try how would they pick a light bulb? So in order to use some probabilistic utility, the question was, what do you think is most important when you pick a light bulb? Because we all go and buy a light bulb and we think about this internally, maybe not formally, but there's trade-offs. And so 36% of the respondents thought saving money as a result of increased efficiency was the most important. Only 12% ranked environmental friendliness as the first. So yet again, we have a spread of data. We also said, would you use more if you adopted a more energy efficient light bulb? Which, it's, it's crude and surveys are never perfect. Every time I talk about something like this, people tell me surveys are never perfect. And I say, yes, they're not, I know. Um, so about 50% said they would use more light. And we said, okay, well, how will we use more light? So of that, 33% would leave current lights on longer, 31% <coughs> would purchase more lights. And you could do both. So we have this model, we have some scenarios predicated on the rebound of factor Jevons paradox, the idea that people will consume more. So there's scenarios with varying degrees of if you consume more, how much more light would you consume? Because the question is, when are you going to erode the savings gained by efficiency? So it varies from no rebound, and we have some spontaneous adoption where people say, I don't care that my light bulb's not burned out. This LED is so cool, I must go buy one right now. Which happens. We're all guilty of that sometimes or something. Um, to scenario eight, which is extreme rebound. If you buy a more energy efficient bulb and you're that 50% of the population, you will leave your lights on 75% longer and buy 75% more. So the results aren't that surprising. We have our average annual household light consumption in megalumen hours. So in the extreme scenarios, the respondent, you consume a lot more light. You'd expect this. So the question was really, what does energy consumption look like? And in the extreme scenarios, you consume a lot more energy. More energy than you were consuming initially. So what does this mean? So this is comparing with some data from the US Department of Energy. In their earlier studies, they didn't consider the rebound effect. But they did consider a 1.75% annual growth in lit spaces due to bigger houses and expansion of lit spaces. So this is comparing their data, the Navigant USDOE, with the non-extreme rebound scenarios. So in the study, we found that, OK, we can predict that energy consumption for light will drop a lot. And then eventually, it'll inch back up, which is what the paper by Damas out of MIT that looked at all the sectors said. Unless we come up with something new or we come up with a policy, we're eventually going to outconsume. So this brings up an interesting question called the saturation of light. So what is the limit for light? Is it constant daylight everywhere, all the time, outside even? Is it light of a certain brightness? Does the saturation for light in a room change depending on who's designing it? So we don't know. And there was a paper a few years ago by Tao et al. that said, it was a controversial paper, they got lots of comments, um, that said using um, some, a Cobb-Douglas framework, we don't think we've reached saturation of light anywhere in the world. OK, so going on that, there's this question of what is saturation of light? 
what does it look like? But there's this question because LEDs are an enabling technology. So what if we start using light and lighting for things we never have before? Or what if we start using bigger things we haven't thought of? So this is looking at television screens. So the new flat screens common have, commonly have LEDs or all LEDs. TV screens are getting bigger. In 2015, 52% of television sales were between 40 and 49 inches. And 20% was greater than 49 inches. So it's an enabling technology. We can make bigger televisions. We're consuming in ways we hadn't thought. What about this? Does anyone recognize this? <laughs> so, County Stadium, and circa 1950s, I believe. So this is a scoreboard. And County Stadium no longer exists. But does the scoreboard in Miller Park look like this? No? So, okay, this might have had some light, but it's not some brightly lit television display. And here we go. This is a scoreboard at Miller Park. And we've got these black and, this black and orange lighting. And what about today? We seem to have caught Clay Matthews. So we're using light in ways we wouldn't have thought to in the past. If you would ask someone in the 1950s, is this the scoreboard of the future? I don't know that they would have known. So it's hard to come up with a saturation for light and a limit if we have all these new ways to use it. And another example is a book. So Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, very famous book, credited with the environmental movement, um, talking about the dangers of chemicals, which isn't really a topic of this, but OK. Is this the only way to read books today? <coughs> No? Mm. All right. So this is the first Kindle in, I believe, 2007. So only 11 years ago. And both of these are not backlit. You need light, but light comes from external sources, light for illumination in the room. But then we go to something like the Kindle Fire, which you can buy today, or many people probably bought on Prime Day yesterday. Um, and you still need light, but you've got this backlit screen. So we're using light in new ways that we haven't thought of before. And I mentioned that LED is an enabling technology and novelties. So we're using way, we're lighting things that we wouldn't have lit before also. So we've got LED screens, but how about some pretend candles that change color? Or light up glasses or rope lighting, which on the way in someone told me they bought for their garage. Or what about a light up shower? You can buy it with an LED and light up balloons and snuggly children's night lights that don't get hot. So it's hard to come up with this saturation of light if we have all of these new enabled technologies coming about. So just to think about conclusions a little bit. Historically, artificial light has been about more than just illumination. It's progress, it's wealth, it's a status symbol. And there's the potential to save energy if we adopt energy efficient technology for a while. But eventually, we either need to come up with a policy or we need to come up with a more efficient technology if we're considering the rebound effect. What is the saturation of light? That's a good question. It depends what we're coming up with next. And there are many novel uses of light, from children's toys to light up showers, which I don't have, but <laughs> maybe someone does, and that'd be very exciting. So with that, I need to thank the University of Illinois Institute for Environmental Science and Policy and the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department here at the University of Wisconsin Management Madison. And I enjoy this for questions. <laughs> Uh, 
I think. Repeat the question, please. Right. So, sorry. So, they were surprised to see that there's still kerosene used for illumination in England, in the United Kingdom. And I don't quite know what that goes to exactly, because it's not what I would assume is popular here. Um, I could look into that more for you, though. On one of your slides, you showed incandescent bulbs. You had three sections. And the uh, number of hours the incandescent bulb was used decreased went from 1,500 to 2,500, and then to 1,000. Lifetime. Right, yep, why, the lifetime. Why did the lifetime, I mean, why did the lifetime drop in the incandescent bulb? So, and that's a really good question. When I was looking at updating my slides, um, I think part of it might be that there aren't as many high quality incandescent bulbs on the market right now because they're largely being phased out. So you've got the better bulbs, more or less. I'm not sure if that was the best answer to your question. But I would say that the highest quality ones really aren't there anymore. But there's some variability, and that's rated lifetime. And there's been lots of studies, particularly with CFLs, that the rated lifetime isn't always the actual lifetime. <coughs> Uh oh, someone way in the back. Uh, I know when when uh, the flat screen TVs first came around, they were all fluorescent backlit, and they were really you, you thought they were efficient, but they really weren't. I have one one forty inch TV that's like four hundred and fifty watts. I have another forty inch TV that is fifty watts, which is LED. Have you know, have people noticed a, a trend in, in more efficient television and less usage of electricity over time? So, do I need to repeat that, or do you? Okay. okay. I, I don't know that I've seen that. There's been some studies out of um, the Rochester Institute for Technology by Callie Babbitt that have looked at device communities. So the premise of her work is that we don't always get rid of our old devices. You know, the old fridge gets downgraded to the basement or the garage. Or that old TV, well, it'll be the basement or garage TV. And... So it's a really interesting question area of study, but a lot of her work is focused on a lot of that stuff still gets used occasionally and we still keep it. A lot of the work actually, and some of it's coming out of the University of Illinois right now, has been looking at going to less toxic quantum dots for LED televisions, um, largely driven by some legislation out of the European <coughs> Union. So that's sort of what I would see as the next way to go. Personally, yeah. I don't think it's that big a deal. I don't know that I would uh, like like a broken one per se, um, or you know, hold it. Um, I don't think it's that big a deal. It's gone down a lot. Some of the early CFLs were more like 40 milligrams, and if you take a life cycle approach, you start thinking about well, but the energy I'm using to power it, if I compare it to an incandescent. I start to see mercury savings. Um, and it's interesting because there's all sorts of interesting things too in LEDs when you start to look at what's in them. But not, mer not that much mercury, so we won't panic about that today. <coughs> there's one over here. Yeah. Um, are you aware of the harmful effects of greater amounts of light psychologically? Yes, um, there's actually been a lot of studies on actually the medical effects too of night shift workers and uh, melatonin production. So yes, but they weren't part of, yes, this is the short answer. Would organic LEDs that are now kind of in their infancy, is that going to just increase how much we use them, or is that actually going to decrease the efficiency and are we going to have the same kind of paradox? That's a good question. Because now we can make a bigger TV and it can fold or it can bend. And, yeah. Right, and that's, that really gets back to that question of what is the limit? How many TVs can we have? If I have a foldable, bendable TV, do I take it camping now? 
what do I do with it? Am I consuming more? So I don't know, but that's sort of a good question to look at. Do you have information about the, uh, op or the ownership cost comparison between incandescent CFL and LEDs like today or more currently? I think the only chart you showed went up to 2000 and it had the CFL still lower than the LED. Right. Um, no, but we could calculate it based on the rated lifetime and the purchase price and the use efficiency and assuming some number for energy. So I don't, but we could. Um, do you think that daylight savings is an effective policy in terms of reducing light consumption? I don't know is really the answer. And I know that's a question people look at, but I haven't. The best answer is I don't know. But that's an interesting question. Has there been a significant change in the uh, light temperature as people have changed their lighting? I know people that I do resisted uh, LEDs because they liked the yellow light right. on their incandescent familiar bulbs. Right, and that's, <coughs> so the question is, changes in light temperature. So the initial CFLs were these cold, described as blue lights. And now, actually, on the pseudo food label, it has a scale of warm to cool. So how blue, how yellow is it? Because LEDs are interesting, because there isn't a white LED. You're combining colors to make a white LED. So you can control, do I want a yellow or a softer glow? And people want different lights depending where they are, too. Maybe you want a fluorescent in your kitchen. And maybe you don't want a blue light in your living room. These are just generalizations. You might be very, very different. So I think we've gotten better. Um, I think part of the initial thing with CFLs was it's more energy efficient, so people will buy it. And in my class, I talk about, well, if things are better environmentally, we don't always buy them. And so there's this example. Has anyone heard of sun chips? Has anyone heard about when sun chips made a fully compostable bag that would degrade outside? Do we still sell those? So they were better for the environment. They degraded outside, not an industrial composter. They were really loud. <laughs> and in my class, I talk about it that I have quotes from people who are like, you know, you don't want everyone to know you're eating chips. They're really loud. I don't want to hear this crinkle, 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 crinkle. Then everyone knows I'm eating them. So they got pulled off the market because consumers hated them. And so there's this question of if it's better, but consumers won't adopt it, is it really better? Any other questions? Yeah. Is it more dangerous for a CFL to break when it's on and mercury is vaporized, or is it equally dangerous for a CFL to break when it's off? I must admit that's a little bit outside my realm of study. If I had to speculate, I would guess on, but I don't know. Go one and, and two. Is LED or CFL have a faster adoption curve? I haven't seen it. I would suspect that LED is doing better. I know with CFLs there were a lot of early failures with things like they were cold, they didn't work. They had some that weren't screw-in, so you needed a different lamp base. I would suspect, but I don't have anything to back that up. Before CFLs, there were uh, uh, fluorescent lights, and they were used a lot. They were used in industry, they were used in workshops. So, so fluorescent lights have been around a long time, and they were very efficient. They also contained mercury, and so what we, you know, we dealt with that problem with uh, fluorescent lights. And uh, it seems like it was even a smaller issue with the CFLs because there were so many fluorescent lights. Right. 
But you didn't include fluorescent lights in your discussion, right? No, this was looking at um, screw and replacement lights. So you're talking about like the ballast? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be really interesting. And there has work been done on that. Um, this work solely focused on the screw and replacements for thinking about the interchangeability. But yes. Any other questions? No, thank you very much.